All righty, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I uh, hope everyone's having a great day. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about how to build a cybersecurity, OT cybersecurity program uh, today. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, to get us started, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is John Livingston. I'm the CEO of Verve Industrial. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, I spent about 20 years of my career with McKinsey and Company uh, as a consultant helping clients, uh, mostly large industrial organizations, go through uh, digital transformations um, and raising many times the cybersecurity topic in that journey. Um, so I've been with Verve now about six years. Um, Verve was founded uh, about 30 years ago. Next year will be our 30th anniversary. Um, it is a uh, OT cybersecurity software and services company. Uh, we were founded uh, originally as a control systems integrator or automation vendor back 30 years ago. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, we uh, developed our first version of the Verve Security Center, which is a software platform to help manage OT security. And over the last 15 years, we've been helping clients both from our, with our software as well as a range of managed services um, that we offer to clients in the OT security landscape. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today in terms of building a program is based on that experience and based on those last 30 years of what we've learned and, and um, what works and, and what doesn't work. So with that, we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, so three broad topics we're going to talk about today. Uh, number one being um, how, should, how should we think about the starting point for OT cyber? And it's really got to start with the actual threats uh, in the environment. Uh, and so we're going to talk about those threats and what they are, um, uh, what some of the bigger ones, ones are, uh, and how to focus uh, our efforts a little bit. Secondly, then, how to avoid some of the stumbling blocks that we see in building out a program. Uh, and then lastly, how to ensure efficiency uh, and maintenance in the long term. So it's great to say, I'm going to go and improve my security posture, but then to watch that over time. Uh, uh, you know, fade uh, is, is, is disappointing. So how do we then build a program that not only improves our security initially, but also allows us to maintain and improve that security um, <clears throat> and do that in an efficient manner? So those are the three broad uh, areas today. So first, the threat landscape or the, the risks. Um, for those of you who may have been at prior of our webinars, you may have seen us talk or heard us talk about this chart in the past, but we, we, we start here because we think it's critical that everyone realizes that industrial organizations are now really in the crosshairs uh, of the attackers. Um, so this is data from IBM around the number of attacks by industry. And what you see is that the manufacturing sector has moved from uh, the eighth most targeted industry to now, just two years ago, to now being the number one most targeted industry. Um, energy is falling behind that, going from ninth to third or fourth um, uh, most targeted industry. Uh, and so there's been a significant change in the way attackers uh, are targeting organizations today, which is meaning that OT or ICS is even more uh, in, in the crosshairs than it was before. Um, that is evidenced uh, in what we hear from, uh, from operators. Um, so this is a survey of actual uh, ICS security practitioners, the left-hand side being uh, how risky the environment is, uh, in their opinion. Um, and what you can see there is just over a couple year period of time from 2019 to 2021, which was the last time the survey uh, was done, you see a significant increase in the severity and the concerns about the severity of the risk. And then similarly, on the threat vectors, what you see is a, uh, a significant increase in the, um, in the importance of ransomware. So, you know, two or three years ago, uh, ransomware wasn't really even on the agenda, um, but now it's become by far the number one most significant threat, according to practitioners. Um, and that's, by the way, evidenced in the actual attack uh, of behavior. Um, what, what has happened here is, is attackers have realized, you know, you like the old story about, you know, why did you rob the bank? It's because that's where the money is. The money is in operations. The money is in for a ransomware uh, attack, the ability to shut down production. 
um, because they know that the cost of, of downed production lines is so significant that people will pay. Uh, and so we moved from a world where you know, we really need to be focused on insiders or nation states to now a world where um, the, the financial, uh, essentially financially motivated attackers now can target anybody um, and, and hope to get a return. So as we think about how we're going to build a program recognizing those risks, obviously the number of vulnerabilities is also growing quite substantially. Um, these are data just looking at uh, data from ICS CERT, so just ICS related vulnerabilities. This doesn't take into account all the vulnerabilities on Windows assets and, or, or sorry, um, you know, Windows OS and that sort of thing. These are specifically related to ICS software and, and firmware, um, but a, a dramatic increase, you know, 40% increase roughly in the number of vulnerabilities, um, which is obviously overwhelming. Right? As we think about how do we build a program, while we need to recognize and, and, and consider these vulnerabilities, it, it's starting to become overwhelming. Um, and a lot of these, when you look at them, sound quite uh, threatening. Uh, so Icefall, uh, which was published by Forescout um, and their labs, you know, listed 56 different vulnerabilities in uh, various forms of, of ICS equipment, both embedded devices, as well as application software, um, almost all around essentially these, these uh, applications or firmware being essentially insecure by design. Um, these weren't designed for secure principles. And so as you get into this, it's just overwhelming, right? The number of possible vulnerable devices. And many of the cases, you may not be able to fix it. Uh, because it was designed in from the start. And so to an operator, this starts to become just, just overwhelming of what, what do I do with it? I think as we, as we step back, though, we have to recognize th that while the growth in vulnerabilities is critical, is important, and we need to be cognizant of it, right? Mandiant has this uh, rule of 99, which I think is important to keep in mind here when we think about building a program. And that is, you know, in their findings, 99% of the compromised systems are going to be computer workstations and servers. 99% of the malware that's been built is designed for those workstations and servers. The forensics are going to be on them. The detection opportunities will be for activity connected to those, et cetera. And so as we think about how do we build a program, we need to make sure we keep our eye on, you know, those risks um, where the largest threats happen. Um, not to say that the, you know, that all we want to focus on is the workstation servers by any means. However, we need to keep keep that in mind as we think about building a program and how we start off that program. So as we as we then you know start to say, okay, what could you do? You could literally there's going to be thousands of things uh, that you could do to improve the security of an OT environment when you get started to build a program. Right? We're just just some examples of, you know, removing software. Every time we do an assessment, you know, there's TeamViewer, there's, you know, uh, angry IP scanners, there's uh, uh, all sorts of software that you just don't want on an OT system. Um, backups are not up to date. Uh, you've got dual NICs that are in there routing around firewalls. Um, you've got remote access direct uh, into the control system, on and on and on. Um, and so, again, just overwhelming of where to begin, hence the reason why a program focused on the biggest risks is so critical. So as we as we start, you know, that kind of lays a foundation of risks, threats, what's going on out there and how do we think about trying, you know, the challenge essentially of, of how are we going to prioritize all of these. And so the next section, we're going to talk a little bit how, about how to avoid some of the stumbling blocks that we see. So first. Um, kind of building off of that point is how do we know where to begin, right? How are we going to know how, you know, which of those risks do I, uh, do I begin with? Uh, where should I start that journey? Um, number two is we often find um, people jumping into a program without really a clearly uh, defined prioritized roadmap. Um, uh, so often we'll see an organization that we get involved with, they'll have started, okay, we're going to go do network segmentation as an example, which is an important thing to do, but they get 
three, six, nine, 12 months into that journey, and they're finding, wow, this is taking us a lot longer. We, we don't really know what the assets are that we're trying to segment yet. We don't have buy-in of the OT organization of the need. We have to get downtime to get the segmentation completed and no one can give us the downtime, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of jumping in without that roadmap. Number three, not considering the full resource requirements when we begin. So you get partway down the journey and you're like, wow, um, this requires these additional resources or alternatively, um, you know, you, you think we're going to do a certain amount of work this year and okay, well, we'll just add additional resources. Should we need to OT resources don't grow on trees. So finding people and training them, et cetera, is, is a challenge. So making sure we think about the resource requirements up front is important. Next, um, not considering that maintenance phase. So uh, we see a lot of times companies get into this and they'll, they'll jump in and they'll make some progress, but then it fades um, because there's not a consideration. Of how do we maintain that security? How do we make sure that, you know, quote unquote, rot doesn't set in uh, to our security program? Um, next, ITOT coordination. Um, so how do we, you know, the, the challenge is balancing um, those requirements, IT requirements, OT requirements, and building a program that fits. And then finally getting distracted. Um, a lot of times we, we find that, you know, when these new vulnerabilities get announced, um, and a lot of times, you know, software, or sorry, security vendors, you know, are out researching vulnerabilities, which is great, um, but they'll publish these, they'll get a lot of press, et cetera. And when you actually go into the risks in the environment, what you find is, yeah, but nobody's patched the WannaCry vulnerability. Um, and you've got critical vulnerabilities on that, on those workstations. Um, yeah, you, you should be concerned about those, you know, the, the ice falls of the world, by the same token, you know, first things first, right? And so you can get, get pulled into a lot of chasing um, if there's not an overall program in place. So those are some of the common challenges and we're gonna talk through how we deal with those. So the first is, where do you start, right? What is, how are we gonna get started here? Um, and so there's a very, a lot, of, a lot of text on this page, but um, basically the point here is, let's start with some form of a framework to give us some guidance. Um, on the left-hand side, what you see is over the last few years, what are the different standards that are being used by ICS security practitioners? Um, NIST CSF being by far the most, uh, most used framework. Um, and in many cases, organizations are blending the two, right? So they're using a, a general NIST CSF, but then they may be applying IS, IC 62443 in particular uh, areas of that, such as network, uh, network protections. Um, the point, however, in any of these is, you know, allowing or giving yourself a standard to shoot at so you know where you're going. And then the right hand side just highlights for NIST, which is by far the most uh, used. What are the elements of that? Um, and we lay it out in this manner because we're going to come back and talk about sequencing over time. But we really believe in the notion of these pieces working together rather than just being a list, right? And many times NIST is is kind of a spreadsheet, right? We think this approach of thinking about it as a wheel is really important because you start someplace, you start with identify, right? Knowing what your inventory is, knowing what your vulnerabilities are, et cetera. And then you can work around to the rest of the elements of the NIST CSF. Um, anyway, starting with some kind of a framework that gives us a, a direction is, is step number one. And so then how do you develop a sequence program um, against a standard, an internal standard, uh, uh, um, whatever, whatever goal you have? So we think about this in three areas, uh, three ways. So first is the impact. So what is the degree of risk reduction that I'm going to get out of any part of the program? And by the way, on the flip side of that, what's the potential uh, operational impact of implementing that control? So it may be great to have that control, but there's a bunch of operational challenges to doing that from a, from a production point of view. So that first one is impact. The second is sequencing. How do I order these things? There are certain things that are foundational that are really necessary to building the program that you got to get in place, asset inventory being probably the biggest one of those. But then how do I do that? And then how do I um, do things 
that allow me to have speed uh, to implement? How do I gain scale quickly? And then lastly is the, is the third piece, which is resources. So for that sequence program, once I know those things that are gonna have the highest impact and how I wanna sequence them, how do I make sure I can do that given the resources? So how do I, uh, what are the costs to deploy it? And how am I gonna frankly balance those costs and do things within a budget? Um, and then how do I leverage shared resources and make sure I have resources to maintain it over time? So these three axes is how we think about, this is how you can develop a program um, to uh, uh, make progress in as fast a way possible in, in the most, uh, most reasonable uh, budgetary way. So there's really typically three phases to that program build. The first phase is around assessment where you're identifying and prioritizing the risk and building the roadmap. The second is then the remediation phase, which is usually a kind of a one-time increase, step change in the security levels. Okay, I'm gonna you know, patch all critical vulnerabilities. I'm going to you know, segment the network, et cetera. And then there's the maintain phase, which is ongoing maintenance and improvement, frankly, of your security postures over time, and then ongoing detection of new threats um, and responding to those threats as they happen. And each of these phases of the program is pretty critical to get, to think about and, and bring into an old, organized fashion because they build on each other. But if, you, if you're not thinking about the next step, like maintain when you're doing remediation, you may, uh, you may make some mistakes. So we're gonna dive into those three pieces. And the first is the assess piece. So back to the point around sequencing here again, um, where do you start, right? Well, the assessment will start, has to start with inventory. You can't do an assessment unless you understand your inventory, whether it be the NIST CSF, whether it be uh, the CIS top 18, ISA, they all have as one of their first controls, IDAM1 for NIST or control 1.1 for CIS is inventory, knowing what you have. Um, and that inventory is going to act as the foundation of your assessment because it's going to build your visibility into what you've got, both from a hardware point of view, a software point of view, a user and accounts, a network, et cetera. That, that foundation is key. And so our view is that, that that assessment or eventual endpoint management is going to start with a very deep asset view. So at one layer, you can think of the ocean of saying, okay, look, I, I can see some traffic. Um, I, can, I can basically know some basic information about the traffic going through some perimeter network devices. At the next layer, I can maybe infer some things on that. Um, I can get maybe the firmware versions in some cases, maybe I can infer based on the traffic of, of what that device is at the end, but I'm, I'm still pretty uh, limited in my sonar, so to speak. Our view is you got to get all the way down, quote unquote, to the bottom of the ocean if you're really going to do a, a robust assessment. So A, um, on the right-hand side here, is getting to see those assets that may be remote. They may be through a backplane of a PLC. Number two, getting visibility not just on the device type, but what is all the software that's on that device? What are all the applications? Or the vulnerabilities on those. Um, also knowing the accounts, so and the users and the accounts and how those are set up, what the password status is. Um, having the configuration data off of devices, whether that be you know firewalls and the rules and the firewalls or configurations on on Windows assets, um, AV signatures, backup status, you name it. Right, the ability to go deep in there allows me to then assess what's the real risk of that environment. Um, system types, um, and, and this all starts to allow what we call a 360 degree risk assessment. So by, by looking deep down in each asset and within the networks, I can build a holistic view of the risk because as I build my program, I need to know the whole risk. I need to know what are the things that I can do. If all I know is the quote unquote vulnerabilities on the devices, which is important, well, I may not be able to patch those right away. And so how do I think about the compensating controls that I have in place potentially to address that vulnerability? So um, a 360 view looks at vulnerabilities, it looks at patches, looks at configurations, it looks at users and accounts, it looks at malware status, it'll look at network protections, et cetera. 
Um, and all of that to basically be, be built into a, a model that we can say, okay, here are the greatest risks. And when I think about remediation in the next phase, here are the things that are most, most critical in that, in that journey. And so from there, we want to build a comprehensive risk view, a risk view across what we refer to, you know, is what's referred to as defense in depth, right? Starting at the endpoint. So knowing I've got an inventory, knowing what my missing patches are, knowing the configurations, et cetera. An assessment, the next level around access control. So am I controlling those? Do I have passwords uh, set in the appropriate way? Do I have default passwords out there? Um, am I controlling access to new devices connecting to the network? Um, am I controlling remote access appropriately? And there's ICS network, things like the, the, the segmentation within the perimeter between IT and OT, and then obviously the perimeter network, and then eventually policies and procedures around incident response, patching, et cetera. But this holistic view, which you can only get if you get down deep into the network from an inventory point of view, um, allows us then to start to build a roadmap based on risk, based on what are those things that are going to be most critical to me, or sorry, to our organization in, in protecting ourselves. And that all then boils down eventually into a risk score. So initially, I want to know the asset type, and up at the top here is different, you know, criticality of assets. Um, is it a safety system? Does it control critical processes? Does it allow me access into other parts of the network, et cetera? And by building up that asset type and the criticality, I now have a sense of, okay, these are assets that really, really matter. Now, what are my risk components? Meaning, is it, is it patched? Uh, do I have a lot of vulnerabilities? Is, is there a bunch of users and accounts that are dormant or, or shared passwords, et cetera? And that gives me some form of a, of a risk score initially. And then apply those mitigating controls things like application whitelisting or firewalls, et cetera, which allow me then to balance that score out to things that might mitigate some of those risks to eventually give me a risk, an overall risk score. The reason this is important is when we get into building the program, we wanna know which risks are the greatest, which ones have, which assets have the greatest risk to us so that we can prioritize those remediation efforts. So from there, the program, you know, we, we start that program with really knowing our risks, prioritizing those, and then we move, move into remediation. And so, as we said at the beginning, there's lots of things we could go do. The assessment helps us get our hands around the risks to know what we want to, what, what our problems are. So then we say, okay, where do we begin once we know that? And so, um, these are our experience based. We, so we looked at all the standards, um, CIS 18, the implementation group one, which is sort of your most basic set of security controls. We looked at IC 62443 and the, the foundational elements there, um, FR 1, 2, 3, et cetera. We've looked at CISA and what are the recommendations that CISA makes for our critical infrastructure and then finally regulatory standards. And then we've added to that what we've seen, right? 30 years of of, of looking at these systems and understanding the risks. And to us, these things on the right-hand side tend to be those that will be the biggest impact um, uh, for, for improvement. So we start at the endpoint side, um, again, back to the inventory management, having a vulnerability and patch management program, employing application whitelisting. Um, we're gonna talk more about that. Um, and then hardening configs on those endpoints. On the network side, making sure your network is secure um, at the perimeter as well as within the ICS network. The access control side then, managing user and account access um, is a critical element, particularly MFA when we're doing remote access, standardizing on a single remote access point, et cetera. We're gonna talk more about that. Detection then, having, having a form of detection, you know, at least getting log data uh, change data, et cetera, from the endpoints, and then over time adding network intrusion detection uh, data. And then finally respond and recover, right? In some ways, the first thing to go do is until you've got the rest of the security is make sure we've got backups and make sure we have an IR plan in case something happens. 
But based on what we've seen, based on looking at the standards, et cetera, um, these five broad categories with these sub controls, so to speak, are those that we believe anyway are, are the place to begin that remediation journey. So if you've got to do these various things, how do we, how do, we do that? Um, well, the first is the vulnerabilities. So as we think about, we've already talked about asset inventory. So now as we get into try to prioritize which vulnerabilities we want to do in a vulnerability management program, we're going to have, you know, when you start this, you're going to have thousands of vulnerabilities, potentially thousands of critical vulnerabilities. Um, so the first thing is, okay, prioritize those down by looking at those that have a high number of exploits or exploits available, right? So looking at the CISA uh, KEV, which is the known exploit exploited vulnerability catalog, looking at for things like the WannaCry or Blue Keep um, uh, vulnerabilities. Then once we do that, we then can start to narrow down on given that, okay, so we know the critical ones, we know those with exploits, um, let's start to look at compensating controls. So let's drill down on those assets with whitelisting, for instance. Let's drill down on those assets that, have, that are critical. And finally, that 308 is, all right, we're gonna look at assets that are critical with critical vulnerabilities where there's, a, where there's an exploit available, where there's no application whitelisting and no backup. And there you've got an asset, a set of assets and a set of vulnerabilities where these things are, they're really not protected in any other way from a very, very critical, highly exploited uh, um, vulnerability. And that's how we can laser in. And some of these data, this data is from the Verve uh, tool, which we'll describe in a little bit. But this, uh, this idea of getting down and being able to parse this data to be able to know where to focus is key to building that program in our view. And those vulnerabilities, obviously then, you'll wanna lead towards patching those where possible. Um, and so the way we think about this is trying to get to your 80-20, right? So when you build a remediation plan in your program, try and prioritize your patching. So this is a, a chart out of Verve where we say, okay, how many CVEs does each patch remediate? And therefore, how many total of my CVEs, critical CVEs, you can think about a lot of ways of sorting this, but how many of those critical vulnerabilities that have an exploit, for instance, am I actually able to resolve with that patch? Um, and so being able to focus ourselves again on remediating things that give me a big quote unquote bang for the buck. Um, as we think about remediation, then um, we got to move beyond just the, the vulnerabilities and patching because in many cases you may be fully patched in OT, but the access control is a mess. Um, oftentimes because these things aren't managed through a central AD server, um, you know, oftentimes OEMs have their own domains or frankly, not only their own, but they may have multiple domains within a plant, for instance, um, which often aren't well managed. And so we've got local user accounts, we have local admin accounts, et cetera. So gathering all that data when you do your inventory and then starting to manage those, those accounts, the users, the password settings, et cetera, is another key element of, of the remediation plan. Um, we talk a little bit about whitelisting. That's also part of the endpoint side of, of the remediation plan. Um, so one of the questions came in before our session today was, you know, is application whitelisting dead? I think far from it in, in the OT world, right? So a lot of times we can't apply patches um, and, you know, we need some form of a compensating control. And AV oftentimes is difficult to keep updated in OT. Right, signatures are difficult um, uh, in, in distributed environments where you don't have access maybe, and you certainly may not have ability to put in a modern EDR tool. Um, the good news, however, is that OT environments are more stable. So application whitelisting in IT is really hard, right? Because people are adding apps all the time and managing literally thousands of different applications. It, 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 it's really unwieldy, but in OT, we don't want them to change, right? We don't want people adding applications. And so the, the effectiveness of a whitelisting kind of application is, is much better. In fact, you know, DHS has said in, in a prior uh, report um, that whitelisting you know, was one of the most significant ways of protecting OT uh, in terms of reducing the actual incidents. 
and and it's actually feasible, very feasible to deploy this on a vendor agnostic fashion, right? If you understand control systems and how to program them and understand the, you know, uh, which applications need to run, um, it's it's very feasible to deploy this, and it's a great compensating control um, at that layer. So this answers one of the questions that came in before, but we we strongly believe that this is a great effective tool within OT. And then on the networking side, right? There's a set of remediation steps that we'll want to take. So first, making sure we're we're securing our remote access. Uh, the number of times that we'll do an assessment and see, well, you know, it's supposedly air gapped. Well, it may be air gapped from corporate, but remote vendors have tons of remote access, which isn't managed. It's not centralized. It's not tracked, et cetera. Number two, you know, the there are VLANs that exist, perhaps, but not well managed, right? Things have been moved. You've got, you've got rules that aren't really very well laid out. And so you've got IT devices connecting into the OT VLAN and vice versa. Um, so fixing some of those, uh, essentially configuration of VLANing is, is a very valuable thing to do. Uh, building on that then going into your firewalls and, and switches and actually hardening the rules, hardening the configs on the, the existing equipment, right? Um, eliminating dual homed connectivity. So we may have a firewall, that's great, but the traffic's not going through it. Variety of reasons for this, uh, et cetera, but great, well, let's use the equipment we have and, and try to, try to uh, put that traffic through the firewall as an example. And then over time, building up a proper network segmentation. The point here is that as we think about that remediation roadmap, having activities that we can do that can use the current infrastructure and investments we've made like current firewalls and switches allows us to make some progress in a hurry without having to, to spend a lot of money in the short term. Obviously there may be a need for you know, new firewalls, more segmentation, et cetera, but in the short term, there may be things we can do to improve our security. And so as we, as we discussed the impact, right? That was really a lot about the impact of what are the things that we can do to drive impact? We then need to think about the sequencing. So what goes first, what goes second, what goes third? And this is a representative example. Um, it's not necessarily true for everybody. So uh, we you know, don't take this and say, oh, okay, we'll just go implement this. But let, us, let me explain the logic behind this sequencing. Right, so we've we've laid out on the left hand side here the various you know, NIST CSF components, um, beginning with some basic policies around access management, around IR, around patch, etc. But then that first piece of let's get clear around our inventory. Right, it's it is the enabler for the rest of these things. Right, without that, we really can't do much uh, beyond it. Also, then gathering configuration inventories, account inventories, software. So we got software inventories. All of that view allows us to then build the rest of these things. Early on in this program, you'll see whitelisting right there up front. Um, again, as I mentioned, a very effective uh, solution until you can do things like like patching or or, or network segmentation, etc. Um, and then over time, adding in patching ensuring you've got your backups, et cetera. And then as you can see over time, starting to add on more and more things that, that maybe uh, require more infrastructure, like a network segmentation effort, right? We, you know, that's probably a relatively expensive, relatively time consuming effort, depending on how many plants you have and how modern the infrastructure is. Um, and then obviously over time to, you know, um, you know configuration change management, et cetera. This isn't to say that things at the far right-hand side of this page, the top right, are not important. They are, no question. However, as we think about impact and building a foundation over time to grow with, our strong view is you want to think about your sequence. So you're building that foundation early, getting some quick wins, and then over time adding to it uh, as, as your maturity grows and your, and your foundations improve. So how do we think about sequencing? So the first is, as I mentioned, focus on some quick wins. Focus on some things that reduce risk without a lot of operational disruption. So right, we got hundreds of dormant accounts because vendors have come in over time. 
we've had outages, they've added accounts during the outages and we've never really cleaned them up. All right, great. That's something we can go do tomorrow, All right? Uh, we have whitelisting, but it's not in lockdown. Okay, great. Let's go do that. Um, we have firewalls, but they're really misconfigured and the rules in them aren't strong. Okay. So a variety of things that we might be able to do with our current tool sets, our current hardware to improve the security. Second, I talked about this sequence, the foundational uh, elements first. The third is prepare for the worst early on. So you saw in there backup and IR is relatively early in the journey. Um, once we've got the inventory in there, we wanna start thinking about that because it's, it's the worst case. It's something you can do relatively early in the journey um, that gives you some, some defense, uh, some, some uh, response capabilities. Um, as I mentioned, tuning the current tools and hardware uh, to get the most out of them. Uh, five, when we think about the sequence, thinking about a vendor agnostic solution to these problems. So as an example, remote access, um, figuring out a, a vendor agnostic solution to remote access early on um, uh, allows us to then build off of that rather than having multiple different, you know, uh, uh, remote access solutions. Similarly, on some things like application whitelisting or inventory or vulnerability identification, having a vendor agnostic solution allows me to accelerate faster over time. Next, um, we think about building a gold, silver, bronze kind of approach. So as we think about sequencing, there may be some sites, some assets, et cetera, that are more critical and that really require a quote unquote gold standard. There are others that won't, right? That may be more a bronze standard and identifying what controls and subcontrols we want to apply to each one so that we can lay that out in a sequence. And then the last point, perhaps the most important one of all of these is to consider maintenance when we're doing the remediations. That last step we talked about is being able to efficiently maintain whatever we do. So often we see a bunch of investment gets made, we go build, oh, sorry, we go remediate, a lot of things and then it slowly fades, right? So making sure we're, we're cognizant of how we're gonna maintain it when we put it in. So we're gonna dive into that for a bit. Uh, how do we efficiently and effectively maintain and improve, an, and improve our security program? So the first theme here is to maintain OT cyber effectively. We have to move beyond the plant. We have our boat, ship, or, 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 or substation, whatever is your, your asset type. And we need to think global and act local. And what we mean by that is we need to take the data from those individual assets, sites, what have you. We need to aggregate that centrally. This allows us to see centrally um, all of the current status of my security across all my assets. So I can see patch stats, vulnerabilities, user and accounts, network segmentation, alerts and threats, et cetera, all from one place. And I can build strategies around the prioritization of those remediations. I can build playbooks, et cetera. That efficiency, that, that, that centralization allows efficiency um, to getting all that data into one place. Then when we wanna actually take actions, so we wanna patch something, we wanna harden a config, uh, et cetera, that's where the local piece comes in, right? That's where we don't want to have likely people, you know, 5,000 miles away, you know, pushing patches. Um, we want to make sure that that's done in a very controlled fashion. People who understand those processes um, and we can distribute the actions locally down to the local site, but then people who know that process approve the action before it happens. This allows us to scale effectively, not to have a, sec a security person at every plant, um, provide automation to those folks at the sites, but then ensure that when those actions happen, they're done in appropriate time and fashion that we don't disrupt operational uh, uh, processes. So being able to maintain this, in our view, requires some form of, of aggregation and centralization. Maintenance also comes down to how I am going to find the people and, and uh, uh, essentially skills that I need to do this. And so while there's a whole, probably another webinar to talk about organization and, and, and staffing and training, but the important part we wanna get across in this chart is 
the 78 and the roughly 15. So um, what this is, is data from the NIST's NICE and ICE CyberSeq database. So these are essentially taking all of the open jobs in cybersecurity, not just OT, but IT as well, and looking at, okay, so what are the job tasks? What are we doing? And what you find is that almost 80% of these tasks are what we refer to as basically systems management tasks, right? They're designing a network architecture. They're doing patch management, configuration management, vulnerability analysis, et cetera. And only about 15% are the, what I'll refer to as kind of the sexy stuff, right? The detailed analysis, the incident response analysis, the anomaly detection, et cetera. Not to say that 15% isn't really critical, it is. But as we think about maintaining our security levels, what happens without systems management is things drift and, and they rot, right? AV signatures aren't updated, configurations get out of line, patches don't get deployed. And so if we're going to maintain our security, we need to apply systems management into the OT environment. So we need to, to have these, these skills somehow brought over and, and capacity brought over into OT. Today, there may be very little in the way of people looking at any of these devices and any of the systems management going on in OT. And so if we're going to maintain this in our program, making sure that we can, we can uh, uh, do that uh, in a way where we've got enough of our systems management capabilities is key. So as we think about how, do we, how are we going to maintain this, and frankly, how are we going to, to build that roadmap in the first place, our view is we need some sort of a solution to, to, to effectively provide that systems management capability. And so uh, our Verve platform starts with that asset inventory, not surprising given how much time I've spent talking about that today and its, its foundational element. It is the core to our engine, so to speak, right? It's, it's the element that allows you to build those applications, vulnerability management, patch management, configuration, et cetera. Um, Without that, you, you, you don't have the, the machinery, so to speak, to really do effective vulnerability management. If you don't know the asset, if you don't know its firmware version, if you don't know its OS and patch status, it's really tough to do vulnerability management. But this, this notion of, a, of an OT systems management platform allows us to both assess the risk, remediate it, but then maintain it over time because all of that data comes into the same platform rather than being distributed in a bunch of things, or alternatively, which so often is the case in OT, left at the plant, right? So I've got a Honeywell system, I've got a Delta V, I've got something else. Each one has its own security tool and it's at the plant. And so now I'm trying to manage 300 different security tools, it's, it's impossible. Um, and so what this allows for is a vendor agnostic approach to gathering all that data um, and, and managing it. That platform um, allows us then to think about an alternative approach to the assessment phase, which then leads to maintenance. So I said before, you wanna start, when you're thinking about this, you wanna start with, with the full process of knowing I have to maintain it. Okay, well, if I know I have to maintain my vulnerability assessment, what do I, how am I gonna do that? Well, traditionally the way OT assessments have been done, you know, we got limited resources, distributed environments, um, we're doing surveys, we may do site visits. And so number seven here at the bottom, you know, it's really tough to regularly monitor for change if you're doing it that way, because I'm literally sending new people out to the site every year, every two years, whenever you're doing your assessment. By, do, by using a platform like Verve or potentially others um, to do what we call a tech enabled assessment, um, we're getting that data the first time, obviously, from the endpoints, actual risks, et cetera. We don't have to travel and do surveys, et cetera. But the big piece is the last point here, which is it gives a real-time view for the maintenance. I know for a fact, what are my risks? What are my vulnerabilities? And that's updating literally every minute, every day, whatever. Um, and so I can track my progress uh, in my program, right? Part of the, one of the key things of the program is you know, proving out ROI or proving out success and being able to track how are my risks improving over time is a key part to that. And then I can move from that risk assessment down to actions, 
right? So by having all of this in that think global, act local notion, I can say, all right, I've seen the risk. So a new risk emerges, a, a, um, somebody changes a configuration, somebody adds a device to the network, whatever. Um, I can then quickly go from seeing that risk, that new risk that emerged to remediating it, patching it, uh, hardening a config, uh, removing the device from the network, whatever it happens to be. So in our view, having some form of, uh, of a visibility and action platform um, across the, the OT environment is, is really the only way to allow you to, to maintain your program in an efficient way. And so just one example, being able to monitor your vulnerabilities. You know, we often hear in I, from IT, oh yeah, of course, you, you've got to monitor this. We do it all the time. But in OT, it's often very difficult because you, know, you can't just rescan something. Um, you can't, may not be able to scan at all. Uh, and so by having that data directly from the asset, we can, we can monitor how we're doing. Um, and we can see, is our program maturing or is our program fading? Um, and then lastly, you know, being able to do this at a lower cost, right? That, that ability to think forward. So when I'm, when I'm doing my assessment and doing my remediation, I'm thinking about the maintenance and I'm thinking about how much it's gonna cost me to maintain this. And so by using a platform type approach, first of all, I'm gonna get a lower assessment cost. I'm not gonna be traveling around and all of that. But the bigger thing is I'm gonna lower the maintenance costs because I'm not, I'm gonna radically reduce the number of security personnel I need to monitor and track how I'm doing. I'm going to, by centralizing the planning of my remediations when new risks emerge, I'm going to be able to distribute those actions in a much more cost-effective way than having, you know, 50 different site personnel trying to trying to deal with that. And so, uh, a key portion of this back to the maintain part is to be able to 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 do this efficiently. So, as we wrap here today, sort of kind of in our view, sort of four key success factors to build that efficient and effective OT security program. Number one, starting with that goal. What is your standard? What is your company specific uh, 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 metric that you're going to be using? Number two, then um, assessing, right? Getting down, we, we would refer to it as a tech enabled heaven, getting down to those assets and being able to assess that 360 view. Number three, then remediating those based on the impact of that remediation, the right sequencing, and the amount of resources I need to do it. So how do I focus on quicker wins? Um, how do I focus on things that have, that are the right foundational elements first, instead of just jumping into the middle of the program, et cetera. And then lastly, the think global, act local to drive the maintenance, right? To drive efficient and effective maintenance over time. Um, in our experience, these are sort of the four key things to really bring a, an effective program to bear. So with that, I will end the specific uh, um, presentation. There were a number of questions that came in before uh, the session. By the way, if you do have a question, feel free to pop it up into the Q&A. Um, one of the questions was um, with the applic application whitelisting, which I think we covered. Another one was around um, how do we think about prioritizing um, the idea of securing my network versus securing my endpoints. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times people say, well, geez, if I could just get a perimeter protection in place and put a firewall in, boy, all would be good. I'm protecting that inside. And more and more what we're finding is that um, even if, even with that firewall protection, right, getting through that has been relatively uh, common Right, whether it be stolen credentials, vulnerabilities in the firewalls themselves, et cetera. Not to say they're not effective. It, it's great to have a firewall. But then as we get inside, we find that, you know, it's the old hard on the outside, soft in the middle. The, the ransomware, the malware, whatever, it can spread very, very quickly because of essentially very weak security on the inside of that perimeter. So strongly recommend thinking about a balanced approach to this. Oftentimes also, the endpoint stuff, frankly, can be done more quickly. So a lot of people, oh, well, geez, I don't want to mess with the endpoints in OT. Not to realize that, well, if I'm going to do a full network segmentation project, I may have to literally replace switches, um, reroute network connections, maybe re-IP. You know, is a lot of effort 
and time in that. Not to say it's not necessary. Eventually, you probably want to do that. However, a lot of those endpoint things you can do quickly. Right? We can we can make a lot of progress on our security risks um, at the endpoint before we get to network. So just just some thoughts around uh, around network versus versus endpoint. Um, another question was around organization. We actually have a whole webinar, I think, on our website around the organizational topic. It's it's really worth its own uh, own whole topic here. Um, just briefly to cover some some thoughts there. So. Um, IT over time is going to become more and more a driver of OT security, all right? This is whether it be insurance, regulators, boards of directors, they are gonna to wanna to see an integrated view of cybersecurity. However, I said that, it's not just as easy as, okay, great, I'll just go deploy all my IT stuff in OT, right? It's different. We have different types of devices, we got legacy, et cetera. So there's gotta be a balance there. Um, Therefore, as we think about organization, we need to get those IT teams, security teams and OT working together rather than at cross purposes. So one of the things we find to be really effective at this is an initial set of workshops that we'll do with clients where we'll bring both sides together and we will basically share experiences, share here's what we've seen, here's the risks, here's the kinds of things that people do to fix them. By the way, here's the benefits to OT, right? Here's the benefits to operations of doing this beyond just the insurance benefits, i.e., you know, possibility of, a, of an attack, but more, you know, here's the operational benefits, right? If you have this data, here's some of the things that you can do um, from an operational improvement point of view. So anyway, one of the, by bringing those groups together, key number two then is as much as possible, give the IT security teams what they're used to from an OT security point of view. So 15 years ago, um, when we built Verb, the first initially built Verb, the whole concept was, and it still is today, make IT security work in OT. Um, you're gonna have to change certain things. There's gonna have to be technical exceptions, et cetera. But when we think about vulnerabilities, when we think about patching, when we think about uh, uh, configuration status, et cetera, provide that in such a way that the CISO and others in the IT security world can naturally absorb it and understand how to prioritize risks, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, our view is if you tell people, well, look, you can't get any data from the endpoints, you just have to do network. Well, that's not a very satisfying result, nor is it a very secure result. So bringing IT security capabilities with OT sensitivities and OT tuning, which is kind of how we ended up getting into this game of basically building IT tools, or sorry, yeah, IT security using OT tools, um, in our view is, is the best way to make those organizations work together. And then the last point in organization, I'll just refer back to some of those charts around, around systems management. Um, uh, you know, there are people in the organization that have experiences, use them, bring them out, um, tap into them from an OT security point of view, and then, and then leverage their systems management skills to start managing um, your OT systems. So with that, if there's no more questions, um, I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we, we look forward to doing another one of these. It will happen probably in the second uh, week of January. We'll be sending out invitations for that. Uh, we're still debating the topic, um, but uh, really appreciate everybody joining today and look forward to seeing you on future webinars. So thanks so much. Have a good day.